Columbia River is called in St. Ike's, St. Ike's. It actually identifies us and where we're from and why we're here. That's what created us. There's this really classic paddle event that happens every summer that goes from Micah Dam to Revelstoke Dam called the David Thompson Classic. It's like a 140 kilometer paddle that you try and do in 24 hours. I've actually never gotten my stuff together well enough to do the David Thompson Classic, so for some reason, it seemed like it'd be easier to do it in the winter time. And then I was like, well, if I'm gonna do it in the winter time, then I should just snowboard as well and it might make a really cool snowboard trip. There's kind of only two people that I know of and that I hang out with that would be dumb enough to do something like this with me. So I get a phone call from my buddy Nick. The first thing that I thought was that it's gonna be horrible, miserable, and impossible to accomplish. The second thing that I thought was that these ideas that come to Cater's mind are usually really fun to do. First I thought it was crazy. And I thought about it a bit and I was like, well, you know, there's a lot of things on the other side of the lake that'd be really cool to go shred. I've always wanted to get up in there. The Northern Monashies are kind of mythical. Nobody ever goes there. The last piece of the puzzle was finding someone to come along and film the whole thing. Yeah, Johan suggested this trip to me. I thought, oh, that sounds cool to film. I didn't give it any further cognitive thought than that, which might have been a mistake. Me and Nick are both total optimists. Uh, so we met up at his house and just lightly planned the whole trip, not really thinking about where to camp, what to do if something went wrong. Yeah. Fortunately, Seb is much more of a realist. We like made emergency response plan of escape routes throughout the whole thing. I spent the whole night just like mapping out every little road that you could actually use and make your way off the lake. David Thompson was recognized as the first European explorer in this region. He was born in England and came to Canada in 1784, and he was trained as a surveyor. He left the Hudson's Bay to work for the Northwest Trading Company, and they were wanting to do some exploration in the West and started to explore the Columbia and Kootenai River systems in the early 1800s. Thompson and his party navigated the entire Columbia River, and by 1811, he'd completed his survey of the entire river he was able to create maps of this region, and that really opened up the Columbia River for trade and other exploration. So after five intense days of last minute prepping and planning, we were finally ready to leave on this trip. My expectations for the trip were kind of overridden by my growing sense of anxiety once I realized that it was going to be quite difficult. I'd been winter camping once before. I was woefully underprepared. I was really anxious about the concept of staying warm at night. <laughs> Finally on the road, 9.30, good start. All packed up here, finally leaving town. A bit worried because I don't feel very nervous. I feel like I should be more nervous about this trip than I am. I feel pretty confident. It just allows you to start thinking about what we're doing, I think. If 
by the time we like loaded the trucks, drove to Micah, unloaded the trucks, brought the stuff to the water, and then loaded the canoes and paddled across. It was like, that was a whole day just to like get that whole show going. I grew up in the East Coast. I grew up rowing, sailing, canoeing. So I have experience. I just assumed everybody else had experience. Yeah, more left. Then I hopped in a canoe and we started paddling and like we we're trying to correct the canoe, but we we're pretty much just going in a circle. It was like, what are we doing wrong? I don't even know what we're doing. So the first camp was so cozy and comfortable that it gave us a false sense of security that this trip was going to be easy to do. It's good stuff. Tomorrow we just like shred hair all day, stay in the trees or something. Yeah. And then Sevi said like Saturday is supposed to be somewhat yeah. overcast. Overcast, maybe that's a good travel day. Like yeah, totally. If it's dumping tomorrow, might as well shred some pow. Yeah, for sure. That'd be cool. The first camp was brilliant. It was relatively warm. Just instantly, once we got on the trip, I had that feeling that I really wanted to have of just being cut away from unnecessary distractions that waste so much of our time in life. And just be a part of your surroundings instead of be glued to your phone. It's a good thing those cameras won't capture the smell that comes out of those sleeping bags. So the first day of riding was pretty sweet. We were kind of just like exploring, getting our bearings. We had no idea what to expect, what we were gonna find. The conditions and training in the first camp was so fun that we just kept riding throughout the whole night. Saturday night is going to start cooling down.
But it's a good travel day, maybe. I think so. Uh, I think it'd be a good travel day, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Because the next day is going to start getting sunny, and then it's going to be, like, a lot of sun. So we might yeah. as well try and, like... I yeah, think that'd okay. be a perfect timing to move. So tomorrow is the first day of real paddling. It's going to be 25 kilometers down to an area we scoped out. We don't exactly know where we're going to camp yet, but we'll figure it out along the paddle. The river might actually be frozen down there since it's getting colder and colder by night now. So it'll be a little bit interesting to see what it looks like. <laughs> I'm gonna close myself in. <laughs> Before European settlement and exploration, there were indigenous people living along the Columbia River. of the St. Ike's people is different now. We were declared extinct by the federal government of Canada because of the Columbia River. Canada and the U.S. were gonna sign the Columbia River Treaty, and just before signing, Canada declared the St. Ike's extinct. We have to stand up for our existence, for our recognition. We have to stand up for this land. Canada did not want to mitigate any of the losses that the St. Ike's people suffered. So they used the Indian Act to dismiss us as a people and to eradicate us from this landscape by a false declared extinction of the St. Ike's people. So you're talking to an apparition here. first big paddling day was definitely a reality check since it was the first time we were packing up the camp and figuring out how to do things. We got on the water super late. Might have uh, underestimated the cold a little bit. Are yeah. oh, you warm, Ben? I can't feel my feet, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Sam. <laughs> Looks like a Michelin man. <laughs> we thought that 25 kilometers of paddling wasn't going to be hard at all, so we took a super casual approach. So this is how I might do the rest of this trip. I'm just going to kick my feet up like this and let Kater over there paddle. It wasn't until later that day, as it was starting to get dark, when we realized that things were not about to be as easy as we thought. We had 15 kilometers to go, and only one hour of sunlight left. Paddling around in the pitch black, trying to figure out where we're gonna camp. We're just like just hammering paddles in the snow and like notching in trying to get up there. So we just end up setting up camp in the dark, freezing our asses. It was really hard work. Ben and I were putting up the tent and you and Kater were grunting, bringing all the gear over. We worked our asses off and yeah, super thankful for that.
What's going on in there? What are you what are you doing? Just getting her nice and warm for later. The smokehouse, that's what we call this now, the smokehouse. Yeah. Big Louie's barbecue. So base camp two were fair where things really started to get interesting. The temperature dropped a lot, the wind increased a lot. Suddenly just going out of the tent to check on how our food was doing was a big deal. Rebels has been issued a wind warning for tonight, 90k an hour or north gust. Yeah, hopefully we don't get blown up with that. We're at the second camp spot. Yesterday we did the 25 kilometer, the first big paddle. Yeah. Got here a little late in the dark, but we managed to set up camp, but unfortunately the storm is still raging, so it's pretty cold out there. Um, we're still in the tent, obviously, trying to get up enough energy to go get firewood because we're running dangerously low. We didn't have any water, our water was frozen. Firewood became a really important priority and we spent a lot of time just maintaining those resources. Also at that point, there was a lot of wind. Good day to be alive. The river was pretty rowdy, so leaving wasn't actually that much of an option at that point. It's just past two o'clock. We tried to get water. I walked to a creek that was way out there. It turns out that it's a lot longer than I thought. We turned back halfway and I was probably a half hour walking. We bailed on that. We're gonna boil some water for this. Yeah, get yeah. out some snow. Yeah, get some water. Almost warm, but good. It's got the forecast here. Monday to Thursday is gonna be a high pressure. Seems like it's gonna be clear skies, minus 30. Potential for high outflow winds in the valley. I hope we're not gonna have too long because we need to canoe somewhere. I really hope that outflow wind dies out because we're gonna have a cold time down here. Yeah. It was so cold that our bodies were barely functioning. I mean, our skins wasn't sticking to the split boards and Seb was getting frostbite on his toes. It's kind of getting a bit late. Everything takes more time than we think it will in the morning. So that's why we're up here at 3 p.m. and trying to get some riding before it gets dark. Our tent with the wood stove was bulky and added some extra weight to the canoes, but without it, we wouldn't have been able to survive there. We developed some good systems for feeding ourselves, feeding each other, spilling water over each other, melting each other's gloves on the fire, you know, survival stuff. We had these lofty ambitions of going up into the Alpine. It just took us forever to get up. We spent three days breaking trail, essentially, to get up there. Imagine just pushing for three days through the subalpine, then as soon as you get up into the alpine, 
you realize just how cold it's been that whole time and how windy it is and how garbage the snow is. Everything was wind hammered. So we're doing a stability test before we ride these lines to see if it's safe to drop in where we are. And then we're like ready to drop on the cool lines that we're really stoked on. Every single camera battery that we could have had just died all at the same time. It was just like way too cold. It's probably minus 35. I think this was probably the coldest snap Revel Stokes seen in like a long, long time. Everything is really touchy. I think, uh, yeah, everything is touchy. Little fly. Yeah, little fly happened there. It's, uh, it's stopped and it's gonna snow with it after it's fine. Trying to get up to the Alpine, trying to get up to the peak just wasn't working. <laughs> Oh, that was a bit spooky. After three yeah. days and four nights of suffering and failure. My nose must be nice and white, eh? We kind of had to admit defeat. Yeah. It, it was right. a lot of work for very little payoff. Tried. We did. Now my toes are cold. I want to go home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the story. Don't get up early and try hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, documentary film is over for now. Now we're gonna go home, see you in the tent. Yeah, camp two. Good times and the worst was still to come. The first major dam on the Columbia River was the Grand Coulee Dam, which was constructed south of the border in Washington state. It was completed in the 1940s. And that dam stopped the salmon run on the Columbia River. It was a major blow to all of the indigenous people who relied on the salmon. All of the dams on the river had huge impacts. The Revelstoke Dam really destroyed the Wild River. This was turned into a reservoir, and people go out and boat there, and they don't have any conception of what's underneath them. The Wild River is tamed. It no longer exists. Cool. Uh, it's about five o'clock in the morning. We all knew that that was going to be the biggest paddle we had ahead of us. Minus 15, it's going to be warm, boys. Almost there, bud. At that point, we were halfway through the trip. We were drained. We had used up so much energy. Now we're about to launch these canoes down here over that ice that I just chopped up. Uh, that's the way we're gonna go, 45 kilometers to down the loop, basically putting all our hopes in to be able to make it. <laughs> so it was Nick and Seb in one canoe and me and Ben in the other canoe. That day, like every other day on the river essentially, the weather was absolutely brutal. It was foggy, it was snowy, and it was cold. Wouldn't be a, a day on the Columbia without it just dumping snow on us. Paddling on the river, me and Ben were starting to get more and more behind the other canoe. So they were just on the edge of our vision and then they just disappeared. This was really reckless, but we had all the radios packed in one canoe. Our plan was just to stay together and not lose each other on the river. Honestly, it was so goddamn cold that we couldn't really stop. And so at one point, me and Seb pulled over to the side of the river to rest because we were ahead of Ben and Johan and we thought we'd wait for them. And we waited and we waited. And eventually me and Seb came to the conclusion that something happened to Ben and Johan. We turned around and we paddled back up the river for at least an hour, maybe more. We paddled up the river looking for them. So one hour passed, two hours passed, three hours passed, and we had seen no signs of the other canoe. So me and Ben decided to pull off to the side of the river uh, just to have something to eat and to warm up. That's when Ben in the front of the canoe just pulls off his glove and I can just hear him starting to panic. 
just had to stop paddling at 25k today. Ben got frostbite on his fingers. They're all white. His hand is completely white. He can't feel or move his fingers. As it turns out, I've got a fairly, uh, fairly legit case of frostbite. I mean, what do we do? We're in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception, no radios. I do have an inReach, uh, so I could call for help from search and rescue. We took one hour for Ben just to warm up his hand and make sure it's okay. A bit scary, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, there we go, she's moving again now. He can move his fingers. Yeah. And I got that warm, burning feeling through my hands, but it was incredible because I knew I had feeling in my hands again and they were gonna be okay. We didn't want to call for help and get rescued because what if Nick and Seb were in trouble further down the river? Uh, my frostbite has subsided. I can actually move my hand, which is pretty sweet, but not well enough to keep paddling. So Johan's doing all the paddling. We're a bit behind schedule, but hoping to still make it to Downy Loop. For that reason, we're a lot slower now. It was getting late. It was starting to get dark and about 25 kilometers left to get to down the loop. We paddled most of that trip not knowing if we were going to see those two again. And then we hear this cheer. It took me about a minute to realize, oh no, it's 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 Cater and Seb. Like, holy shit, they've, they're behind us. We just saw them far away. We were just all shouting at each other. We were just so happy to see each other. They have no idea, they just thought that we abandoned them or that we lost them or they didn't know what was going on. We didn't know either. We're all like probably kind of pissed off at each other, but at the same time, so happy to see each other. Somehow they had passed us. Like when we pulled over to the side of the river, it was really foggy. And even though the river was really narrow at that point. So suddenly all of our feelings of being angry and frustrated just turns to straight happiness that our friends are alive and that we're united on the river again. So once again, we're arriving in the dark, completely exhausted. From that sense of panic, also being able to carry on and make it through that day felt like a huge relief and accomplishment. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was, it was a good day. It was probably one of the best days of the trip in its own special, horrible way. We are responsible for everything that's here. On the ground, coming out of the ground, under the ground, in the air. Yeah, that might be your fishing spot right now. But if a bear comes, you move off. That was that being's place first. And so stand up for your land, stand up for your water. Take care of the things that you yourself enjoy, living in a place where there's clean air, living in a place where there's good water. Lots of people on the planet don't have that. We're very privileged, very, very privileged. And we have to accept some responsibility for the privilege that we experience. Probably an hour before getting to Downy Loop, we saw those wicked pillows on the side of the lake. Like, big stack of pillows and like, shoo, just slow straight onto the water. First one to bring it up was Johan. He was like, man, we got really good to go back there. It's really sick. We all had colds at this point. I'd pretty much lost my voice. Oh, sorry, I was a bit too zoomed in for you both there. Uh, my frostbitten fingers had swollen up and were not looking pretty. So we checked Ben's hand. It looked super ugly, but he was really confident that he was going to be able to make it the rest of the trip. Now we're headed to some pillows that we saw on our way down here. So we're going to spend an extra night down the loop so we can hit some nice waterside pillows. Should be pretty fun. So riding around down the loop was super fun. Those pillows we seen the night before paddling in the dark proved to be these big lines just going down to the river.
It's like 5.30 in the afternoon and I'm fucking ready to go to bed, man. No one has any energy. Uh, really looking forward to my bed in Revelstoke. Mm. Gotta get your daily intake of cheese curds. This is more worth than gold out here. That's how you get things done around the old cap. Mm -hmm. Cheese curds. Straight from the cheese curd mines in uh, Sebastian's hometown. Okay, so we're gonna go for a polar dip. I think that's the only way we can make sure our bodies are like actually resting up and getting ready for the last paddle tomorrow. Oh, I want to go for one more? I'm actually like, I actually feel great right now. This particular piece of property was originally granted in 1864 to uh, George Laforme and he ran the pack train up to French Creek during the gold rush in 1864. It lasted about two and a half years. There was paddle wheels. They actually came up from Revelstoke through the canyon where the dam is now, and that's as far as they could come was about the dam. The Columbia itself here was one of the wider points, and it was very glacial silty, like it was really greeny. Just above us was, was Priest Rapids, and then above that was uh, Death Rapids, and they were extremely, extremely tough. Death Rapids, it was maybe 75 feet across, and it was probably a couple hundred feet deep of water. And you'd see a full-size log come down there, and there were big whirlpools, and they would just stand up and disappear. <laughs> Probably now about 40 some kilometers from Revelstoke. Just left Downey Loop. It's a bit of a struggle to get the boats launched. One, two, three. That was really something. 
with these cold temps, everything's icing up, so all the little bays and stuff were pretty frozen and we were really worried the river was gonna freeze up, basically right here where we are now, around Hat Peak. But as you can see, the weather is nice today, finally, the first day of the trip where it's actually pleasurable to be outside and we're ice free. So, you know, it's been a really difficult trip, but today is actually pretty good. So leaving down the loop, we roughly had 55 kilometers of paddling left to do. Uh, we did that in two days. We had totally ditched the idea of doing more snowboarding because our only focus was to get back to Revelstoke without burning ourselves out anymore. There's certain things you can't control. We're just so used to it in our modern, privileged, normal lives, just to have whatever we want and do whatever we want whenever we want. And it's really great to get out in nature and be exposed to the power of that and realize that that's often not how things work and, and that's okay. And also just experiencing moments of high stress and realizing that it passes and you come out the other side and it's fine. So before leaving on this trip, this whole idea seemed like such a hard and impossible thing to do. And it was pretty funny, but now towards the end of the trip, it felt totally normal for us to put in 30, 40 kilometer paddling days in the middle of the winter in minus 20. For me, that really proved that if you step out of your comfort zone and try things that you normally wouldn't do, those things might not be that impossible that you think in the start. We've all gone through kind of highs and downs. It's really cool to see whoever was on the high, like help the rest of the crew make it through. The good crew is what made this trip what it was. We want people to go and enjoy and be happy with the land, do what makes them good, snowboard, canoe, ski, do all of those things. Love this place. But when you love something, you accept responsibility for part of it. That it's there, it's there for the next generation. So all of this development and all of these things, the best thing we as human beings can tell ourselves right now is no. Do we need another mine? No. Do we need another pipeline? No. This good water, this good land, this beautiful place needs to be preserved because so much of it has been destroyed.